Uh, let's turn to Mary Chamberlain, academic for many years, emeritus professor of history at Oxford Brookes University, author of Fen Women and many other works of history, but now also of a novel set in World War II Europe, The Dressmaker of Dachau. We, we'll come to that, but there's a piece of true history in which Mary played a part, which has just recently been revealed because she was one of the London recruits, a courier into 70s South Africa, carrying ANC materials uh, to help the struggle against apartheid. Uh, just paint us a picture. The end of the 60s, you're very young. Uh, was your background political? Was your family political? Not at all, not at all. But, but I grew up in a very political time. I mean, very much in the shadow of two world wars, very much in the thick of the Cold War, which, of course, was a hot war in the colonies with decolonization and fighting. And I think my generation just couldn't help but be very political. Well, 1968 mm. student rebel of generation. Course, of mine course, too. of course, <laughs> yes. yes. Yeah. So what, but what stirred you most strongly and particularly about the cause of South Africa? Uh, it, was the, it was the injustice of it all. It was the horror of racism. And again, I mean, it was the... You know, it wasn't the Holocaust, but it was the shadow of what could potentially happen when one group of people decide that another group of people are really not worth the kind of human rights that we take for granted. And it, it seemed to me, and I think all of us, just profoundly immoral and unjust, unjust. And the ANC was in a lot of trouble then, wasn't it? I mean, after 1966, I mean, their, their presses were wrecked, their, their leaders yes. in prison were exiled. Uh, Absolutely, and the whole infrastructure had really been blown apart. And they were faced with the problem of how to continue the struggle in South Africa when all the networks, the presses, everything was um, had been destroyed. So they hit on this idea of uh, basically flooding the place with propaganda and producing it in Britain and then smuggling it into the country. And this is where the London recruits came in and, and Ronnie... Uh, there, but there was also there, there was a connection with the, the Communist Party, wasn't there? Because you, you, you were a convinced Communist Party member at the well, time. Well, part of the network of, um, of, of volunteers that Ronnie called upon, and Ronnie Kazrils, who then became Minister of Intelligence in the Mandela government, was then a kind of young um, ANC activist in London, one of the, the exiled leaders. And he called upon the... Uh, the networks of the left, basically. He had enrolled in the LSE and he called on the Young Communist League. Uh, and they then um, set about, you know, re recruiting through those networks. Mm. And we were all young, we were idealistic, we were convinced, as I say, of the immoral immorality and injustice of apartheid and were very happy to. And of help. course that was a sort of a cleaner cause by then, wasn't it? Because by then people knew about Stalin, people people having doubts about the Soviet Union, whereas the South African cause was a kind oh, of... Abs it was abs a clean and obvious oh, one. Oh, absolutely, yeah. yes. So 1972, you go out with your husband, but ju just married, haven't you? Newly married, and um, what we were instructed to do was pretend that we were immigrating into South Africa. So we set sail on the SS file with about 20 packing cases, the old old-fashioned wooden tea chests <laughs> and each of them had a false bottom and inside those false bottoms were about 7,000 comic books essentially telling the story so of really thin magic. thin paper then. very thin paper an awful lot of them and we smuggled it into South Africa as I say under the guise of, of immigrating and then had to buy all the envelopes buy all the stamps and post it around um, well from Cape Town, where we were based all over South Africa. And uh, in the age of the internet, it's, it is rather fascinating to look back and realise how important printed materials oh, abs were. Absolutely. They absolutely. were all there was. They were all there was. And that's what we did. But some of the other recruits would take in thousands of very fine leaflets in the bottom of suitcases, posing as tourists or businessmen, and then would um, devise a very simple kind of device, explosive device, uh, in the, which involved a plastic bucket and a firework, and they would then leave them um, in crowded bus stations, train stations, wherever, and they would be timed to go off at a certain time. So they were leaflet and bombs. They didn't actually hurt anybody. They didn't just hurt anybody at threw all. Threw a lot of leaflets. Thousands all over of leaflets would go all over the place, and it was coordinated. So simultaneously, five o'clock, 
bombs would go off, uh, leaflet bombs, I should say, would go off in Johannesburg and Durban and Port Elizabeth and Cape Town and so on. So, you know, the South African authorities thought that we, uh, the ANC, was extremely active and the networks had really re-established yes. themselves. Do you again. remember any of the names you posted things out to? Well, I mean, some of them were very famous names. I mean, Winnie Mandela, certainly. Um, but there were also some of the kind of tragic, well, not tragic names, but I mean, you know, Joseph in bed 17, you know, dormitory 34, sort of migrant laborers. Migrant and, workers, and you just yeah. knew, you know, the, the tragedy and the... Yeah. Um, injustice behind their stories. But as a British citizen, as a pair of British citizens, did you feel safe or did you fear that if you were arrested it could be actually nasty? Well, we knew uh, if we were arrested it would be very nasty, but we were young, we were you, even as Even as a, a foreign, a, a British citizen, you know, oh, yes, a certain yes, amount of yes. relationship. And, and, and in fact, I mean, one, well, three of us were, uh, were, were actually found um, and served long sentences in, in jail. Interesting, because my dad was at the embassy around, around that time. We, ah, we were well, living he, out there, so he, 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 would, well he would have had to me. look after some of you lot. <laughs> yes. um, but very few of us were caught, actually. That was the whole point. How good, how good were the false bottoms in the cases? I mean, were they obvious? Or, yes, or... very, very obvious, so, which, which we didn't, <laughs> didn't realise at the time. And it was only when we, uh, we had to put the cases into the bonded warehouse. And when we went to collect them, they were stacked, you know, several high. And, Carrie and I saw this line of nails about four inches above the bottom of each one, and we thought only a blind man <laughs> could fail to notice that. And, of course, the, the official in the bonded warehouse, not only was he incredibly myopic, but he was also colourblind. So what he saw were two young white people mm. and waved us through. I mentioned earlier on your, your novel, the, the Dressmaker of Dachau, which is about a young woman caught up in the war in Europe. Obviously mm. a very different world, but did you find yourself drawing on your memory or your memory of the tension and of the cause at that time? Not so much for this one. I, I'm writing another one where I do draw on that, but this one was based much more on an aunt of mine who, in fact, was um, a prisoner of war and uh, set to, to slave labour. So it was partly her story that um, I was able to reimagine mm. in ways that I think she would probably turn in her grave if she read about it now. But of course, something else you, you know about, and of course a lot of wartime generation also knew about, I mean, one thinks of how long it's taken for us to find out about the enigma in you know, Bletchley Park mm. and so on. Your adventure into South Africa, you didn't speak of it. Nobody no, spoke no. of it for... Many years, till three years ago. Uh, yes, I mean, we, we, we kept it quiet for about 40 years. Why and was that? Because it might risk other people out there? Yes, I mean, initially it was security. That if you blagged about it, then, you know, who knows who would hear and um, compromise other um, activities. And then when you could talk about it, it seemed... I mean, how do you start that conversation? By the way, did you know what I did? It just seemed to be boasting. It seemed to be <laughs> vainglorious. And also, I don't think people really believed it. You know, it was not part of the narrative of, of South African resistance. So we just kept quiet. And when we could talk about it, and this was produced in a book um, called London Recruits by um, Ken Keeble, who was one mm. of them, and the proceeds of that, I should say, go to the Nelson Mandela Children's Fund. Um, but when we could, and we had a meeting, Peter Hayne hosted the launch in the House of Commons, and we all met for the first time because we didn't know each other. And it was a very kind of cathartic moment that you felt, finally, you can, you can talk about it and share this. So is there another novel in that? Uh, not about South Africa, but um, I think that's just too close mm too close to my own experience but you you translate those experiences and you run them through the mill of the imagination and they come out in all sorts of different ways uh, it's interesting because actually you're sitting opposite steve baxall who also writes novels uh, and you